Wow. I think I'm going to go out on a little bit of a limb here this morning and make an uncharacteristically bold prediction. Very out of character for me. Later on today, when you are gathering with friends and family, maybe sitting down to your Easter supper, maybe a little ham. We always have ham on Easter. That's just how it's supposed to be, right? Always have ham on Easter. And somebody leans over to you and asks you, so, sweetie, how was church this morning? Here's my bold prediction. That you're going to be able to look over to that friend or family member and stare them square in the eyes and say confidently, well, that was the greatest sermon I've ever heard preached. (laughs) How do you like that for setting expectations? Now look, the reason why, the real reason why I think I can make such an outlandish statement before the end of my first paragraph in my sermon is because the sermon you're about to hear is not really my sermon. Oh boy, we're going from bad to worse already this morning on Easter, aren't we? Aren't you glad you came to Trinity, among other options today? What I mean is, if you'll bear with me just for a moment, is that this sermon, my Easter sermon, is actually that sermon, Peter's sermon from Acts chapter 2. Peter's famous Pentecost sermon. And more specifically, it's that sermon, the first Christian sermon ever preached in the Christian era to thousands of worshipers in Jerusalem, trying to make sense of what had been reported to them, what they had seen with their own eyes on that Pentecost morning, what they had heard with their ears about this Jesus of Nazareth being raised from the dead. They're trying to make sense of that, and this sermon that I'm going to share with you this morning begins to explain and unpack and interpret and imply, apply that sermon. That's why I have confidence that this is the greatest sermon you will ever hear in your entire life, not because of me, but because of God's Word and because it is His truth. Now, Peter's sermon at Pentecost, and by the way, Uh, We're so glad you're here this morning. If you're visiting with us, we are so very blessed that you are with us this morning. You may be here for the first time. You may be in a church for the first time, and you don't know what the word Pentecost means. That's okay. We'll explain these words to you as we go through them. The word Pentecost simply means 50th, 50th. It is connected to the festival of Pentecost or the feast of weeks or the feast of the harvest in the Jewish calendar. It occurred 50 days after the famous feast of Passover. Peter's Pentecost Day sermon has been called the sermon that launched the church. The sermon that launched the church. Not only was it Peter's first sermon, but I would argue it was his best sermon. Out of the 15 sermons or speeches that are recorded in the book of Acts, almost half of them come from the lips of the Apostle Peter, seven of them to be specific. And this sermon, in my estimation, sets the gold standard of gospel preaching for virtually everything that follows, not just in Acts, but all through the history of the church, which itself is a bit interesting if you really think about it. Because you need to remember that before Peter was a preacher, Peter was a total failure. How did it go? How did Peter put it to Jesus? Oh yeah, Lord, even if I must die with you, I will not do what? I will not deny you. That's what Peter said. Just a few weeks before the risen and ascended, Jesus poured out his precious Holy Spirit upon his disciples who were waiting and watching for the coming of Christ This precious promise in the upper room, Peter's life was marked by three things. By fear, by fleeing, and by failure. That to me only bolsters the case case for what we'll be hearing today being called the greatest sermon ever preached. You see, Peter 
uh, we're told, took his stand in verse 14 before a questioning crowd, and he had no notes with him. He wasn't even packing his ESV study Bible that particular day. But what he did have was a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. He had the Holy Spirit. He had everything he needed to be able to preach Christ crucified and now risen from the dead. By the way, aren't you glad that Jesus still uses failures to proclaim his faithful gospel? I know I am this morning. Peter's first sermon was likely his best sermon. Again, itself is interesting because before Peter was a preacher, remember Peter was simply a lowly fisherman. How did Jesus put it to Peter? Oh yeah? Follow me, Peter, and I will make you a fisher of men. See, Peter was no Bible school graduate. He was more like a high school dropout, to be honest with you. Peter was just an ordinary guy until one glorious day when Jesus stepped into his boat and changed his life. See, Peter's entire identity, his life's purpose changed just three years before this big day. And though he might not have known it, by the mercy and grace of God, Peter on this Pentecost day was about to draw in the greatest haul of fish he ever caught in his entire life. Peter's first sermon, friends, doubtlessly was his best sermon because, and it's interesting, before Peter was a preacher, he was a humbled man who had been forgiven. How did it go? Oh yeah, I remember it. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? More than what? Maybe more than these fish? Peter was back fishing again. Maybe more than these disciples? Peter said to Jesus, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, what? Feed my lambs. Preach. Give them my truth. Give them my word. A week after the first Easter Sunday... When Jesus appeared to Simon Peter and to the other disciples, except for Thomas, remember, Peter, perhaps still reeling from his own personal denial of Jesus Christ, not once, not even twice, but three times, something truly familiar he was doing. He was back fishing. And listen, here the Lord Jesus, just after breakfast, we are told in John's gospel, right there on the banks of the Galilee, said to Peter, again, not just once, Not twice, but three times, once for every time, Peter denied Jesus, that that Jesus said to him, do you love me? And he restored Peter. He restored this defeated and discouraged apostle. Peter was now marvelously forgiven and poised to proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead. Yes, church, the greatest sermon ever preached from Acts chapter 2 is a textbook example of Christ exalting, resurrection emphasizing, faithful biblical exposition. It's what you're going to hear this morning. It's almost as if Peter had read Haddon Robinson's classic book, Biblical Preaching, in which Robinson says, I have a conviction that no sermon is ready for preaching not ready for writing out unless it can, it, we can express its theme in a short, pregnant sentence as clear as crystal. In other words, the big idea, that is the one sentence summary from the greatest sermon ever preached, to me is actually found in Acts 2, verse 32. Would you look at that with me? Acts 2, verse 32, where we read these words, This Jesus God raised up. And we are all witnesses to this. That's it. That is the gist of this home run opening day sermon in Jerusalem. Peter says simply, God raised this Jesus up. And we are here because of him. That'll preach on Easter. (laughs) Amen. That's what I thought this week. Now Peter's title to his Pentecost Day sermon might have been something like this. Christ raised by the power of God and, ch- and the church empowered by that same spirit. Something like that could have been Peter's title for his sermon. Everything that we will read in this passage 
from Peter goes on to explain or unpack or illustrate or apply one of those two key points. God raised Jesus and we are witnesses to his resurrection. That's our entire identity, church. We are simply witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here we see the Apostle Peter looking into Scripture in order to understand and then relate to people what was taking place around them on that day. Here Peter provides us with a model of courageous, spirit-dependent preaching, even as we read in verse 14, he raised his voice and proclaimed to them, fellow Jews and you residents of Jerusalem, let me explain this to you and pay attention to my words. Those are good preacher words right there. Let me explain this to you and listen to my words. I'm going to share with you five elements to Peter's Pentecost Day sermon this morning. Let me give them to you here, and then we'll work through them. Number one, explanation. Explanation. Peter begins in verses 14 to 21 by simply explaining what they are seeing in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. It's the work of preaching, not to make something up, but to explain what God has revealed or what he has written. Secondly, interpretation. Peter does, doesn't merely explain. He interprets those events through the grid of the resurrection, through the grid of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, the grid of God's plan to make a world and pour his love into the world in the person of Jesus Christ. Third, Explanation, interpretation, illustration. Peter's a good preacher here. So thirdly, Peter illustrates the reality of the resurrection from a scene in David, King David's own life. That's found in verses 29 to 32. Fourth, what do you do next as a preacher? You apply it. And that's what Peter does. Peter in the fourth part will apply in verses 33 through 36 the gospel. What is the conclusion if Jesus is alive? He will conclude by saying, then Jesus is Lord and Messiah. And we'll see that together this morning. The fifth is sort of a postscript. It's not really a part of Peter's sermon proper, but it's what I call the invitation. Peter begins with explanation. He goes to interpretation. He gives some illustration. He makes an application, and then he provides an invitation to those listening. Peter invites his hearers to do what I'm going to invite my hearers this morning to do, to repent and believe the gospel. Believe Jesus Christ and follow him in baptism. Now, why was Peter's sermon so astounding? And why do we need to sit up and pay attention to it this morning? Let me give you three quick reasons. Number one, Peter's sermon is biblical. Peter's sermon is biblical. It was full of scripture. We don't have a lot of Peter's message. We only actually have a portion of his message. But we have several citations from the Hebrew scriptures. Peter wasn't just pulling things out of thin air. He was drawing them out of the text of the Bible. Peter observes what was taking place in his day in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But he's drawing a direct line from what the people witnessed to the very word of God, what Joel had said, what the prophet David or the King David had said in the book of Psalms, Psalm 16 and Psalm 110. Verse 40 of Acts 2 simply says this, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them. But the foundation of what Peter said that day was the Holy Scriptures. Secondly, Peter's sermon was outstanding because not only was it full of the Bible, it was full of Jesus. It was full of Christ. It was an utterly Christ-centered and gospel-saturated sermon. Peter's message was focused on and full of the Lord Jesus Christ. He interprets the events of Pentecost in the light of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And I'm going to show you that this morning. By the way, the essence of good, faithful gospel preaching It's actually found in the words of John 12, verse 21. Maybe you'll remember that scene. When some Greeks came up to worship at a feast, and they found one of the disciples by the name of Philip, and they said to him, Sir, we want to see Jesus. That's what it means to preach faithfully. It's simply to let people see where Jesus is in the passage, to proclaim Jesus Christ, and that's what Peter does 
here in Acts 2. Peter's sermon was biblical. It was Christological. It was focused on Christ. And thirdly and finally, Peter's sermon was powerful because it was full of Holy Spirit conviction. It was full of conviction. At the end of the day today, in response to Peter's preaching, the crowds are going to ask the disciples there, the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Faithful preaching calls for a response. God, good gospel preaching not only informs, but it transforms. It's not just aimed at your head, but it takes dead aim at your heart. And that's what Peter did on that day. Good gospel preaching not only illuminates the person and work of Jesus Christ, but it summons you, it invites you to hear it into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what we want for you this morning. We want you to not only know about Jesus, we want you to know Jesus personally here at Trinity. Peter's sermon is perhaps the greatest sermon of all time because of its context when it happened. Because of its content, what it said, and because of its consequences, what were the results? It was a truly amazing sermon. Just consider the fact that before Peter preached, there were 120 people in the church. After P Peter preached, there were 3,120 people in the church. That's a great sermon. That's a great sermon. So as we walk together through Peter's Pentecost Day sermon this morning, we're going to see Peter explain and interpret and illustrate and apply the Bible about Jesus to his context. And I'm going to give you four implications of what Pentecost means before we dig into the passage. Let me give them to you very quickly. They're the reason we're here, friends. Number one, Pentecost means that biblical prophecy has been fulfilled. Pentecost means... That biblical prophecy, and specifically Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32, God's promise to pour out His Spirit upon His people, has been fulfilled. Secondly, Pentecost means that a new age has dawned. A new age, an age of grace by the Spirit, full of conviction and full of power, has now arrived in the giving of the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, and may, maybe most relevantly for Easter Sunday, Pentecost means that the Lord Jesus Christ has indeed risen from the dead. No Christmas, no Easter. No Easter, no Pentecost. No Pentecost, no power. No power. Only a risen and ascended Christ could pour out his own spirit upon a group of waiting, eager, desperate disciples. And that's exactly what he did. Fourth and last, Pentecost means that this crucified and risen Jesus is Lord and Messiah. He has no rival, he has no equal, there is no competitor. He's the only one who lives eternally, and who loves wonderfully. And he invites you to do business with him this morning. You need to deal with Jesus personally before you walk out of this church. The resurrection underscores the public nature of the Christian gospel. That Jesus being raised from the dead proves he is both master and Messiah. The question today is, is he yours? Have you come to know him? So firstly, look with me in the text of Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 14, at what I'm calling Peter's explanation of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Listen to God's word once more. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea, and all who do dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's the only the third hour of the day. In other words, it's only nine in the morning. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams." Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. 
And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter's explanation of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Notice, first of all, that Peter begins his sermon actually in response to an important question. What does all this mean? That's really good preaching. You're finding a point of connection with your audience. They have a question. They are puzzled. They are confused. Uh, Luke uses these words in in the passage. Astounded, perplexed, confused, amazed. How is it that we hear these men speaking in our own languages? We didn't know they knew our language. Some of them even mocked these messengers saying that they were filled with new wine. In other words, they are drunk. That's why they're talking such nonsense. And what does Peter, uh, what does all this mean, Peter, uh, they say? And Peter's explanation was simple. These people are not drunk, but rather God has poured out something else, not wine, but the Spirit. God has poured out His Spirit in fulfillment of the words of Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. And I sort of think with a twinge of humor, the apostle draws the crowd's attention away from their false premise, their false uh, theory, rightly, and sets it on the pages of Holy Scripture. He says... Simply in essence, this is not the result of new wine, but the result of a new age. A new age. Something has happened. Something has changed. Scripture has been fulfilled. The Spirit has been poured out. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit has come as a consequence of Jesus Christ being exalted to the Father's right hand. If he's still in the tomb, no spirit is coming down because Jesus alone can pour out the spirit. In fact, Peter says this in verse 33 of Acts 2. Look at the text. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he, Jesus, has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Again, The age of grace and the reign of Messiah Jesus has finally arrived, and it still continues today, friend. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon all of Jesus' followers was a special sign pointing to the promise kept of Christ to give His Spirit to His disciples. It's a day of great judgment and a day of great mercy. Joel And Acts agree, saying, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter's been reading his Bible. That's simply the bottom line. Makes me think of what the German reformer Martin Luther once said. Maybe you've heard this quote before. Take myself as an example. Remember Luther's day against the Catholic Church. I opposed indulgences and all the papists, But never with force. I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And while I slept, speaking of new wine, and drank Wittenberg beer with my friends Philip and Amsdorf, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that no prince or emperor ever inflicted such losses upon it. Luther says, I did nothing. The word did everything. It is the word. Listen to me. Great sermons begin not with man's ingenuity, but with God's trustworthy word. The word of God. Peter simply stepped up and connected the dots. What you see out here is what God said in there. God said he would send his spirit. Are you ready to receive it? So that's the explanation. Let's go to point number two. Peter's interpretation of these recent events. The gospel is true. The gospel is true. Verses 22 to 28. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. 
As you yourself know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Peter's doing something more than just explaining what's happening now. He's interpreting it through the gospel. That's what I want you to notice here, that this message of Peter is not even really primarily about the Holy Spirit. You know that, right? You see what he's saying, don't you? It's about Jesus Christ. Peter is preaching not the Spirit, but he's preaching Jesus by the Spirit. Peter's sermon is not merely an explanation of Joel's prophecy. It is an interpretation of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to a desperate and dependent people through the exaltation and elevation of Jesus Christ. That's what we are seeing here in black and white. I want to point it out to you. Notice, again, how the gospel, which, again, if you're new to our church or to the church in general, you may not understand what the gospel is talking about. It is about the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It itself is the inspired interpretation of the Pentecost event. And Peter says as much. He says in verse 22, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with, many, uh, with mighty miracles and wonders and signs that God did in your midst. Here we have, of course, simply the incarnation, which means how Jesus stepped into human flesh. He is fully God and fully man. He stepped into human form that he might die for humans. Jesus was fully God, fully man. His identity was attested or authenticated by his many miracles and signs and wonders. Through them, he was proven to be the Son of God. The greatest miracle of all, his own resurrection from the dead. Second, Peter says that not only was he incarnated, he was crucified. Notice verse 23. This Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Again, we have the life and the death, the incarnation and the crucifixion of the Son of God. In other words, Peter says what took place 50 days ago was no mere accident. It was no cosmic accident. Rather, the death of God's perfect Son was actually predetermined by the perfect plan of God the Father. He came to die for sinners. He was not swept up into some conspiracy. He laid down his life willingly for us. Peter preached the cross, as all good preachers must do, in his first great sermon. But more than that, and this is awesome, notice verse 24. We have the life we have the death and we have the resurrection of Christ in this sermon. Verse 24, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Do you see what Peter is doing here and why this sermon to me is a perfect Easter sermon? Peter spends one verse on the incarnation or the life of Jesus. He spends one verse on the crucifixion or the death of Jesus. And he spends no fewer than nine verses on the resurrection of Jesus Christ in this passage. Many years ago, I had the privilege of preaching for a few years at the First Baptist Church of Jericho, an all-black church. They, it was awesome. It was absolutely awesome. I was new to town. Pastor Bogan called me up and said, Dan, would, would you come and preach with us on Good Friday? And the, the African-American church, the black church, is famous for saying something around Easter time. Good gospel preaching doesn't leave Jesus in the grave. Don't leave Jesus in the grave. They'll say, come on, preacher, if you're, if you're not getting to the resurrection. They'll say, come on, preacher, get him out of the grave. Amen. Get him out of the grave. Amen. We preach the, the cross, but we don't preach the resurrection. Amen. 
we got to get him out of the grave because he's out of the grave. Only a risen Savior saved lives. Listen, not only is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead a fulfillment of Holy Scripture, and not only is it a fundamental fact of the meaning of the events of that particular day, both Pentecost and Jesus' death and resurrection, but the preaching of the resurrection was the cornerstone of apostolic witness. The cornerstone of apostolic witness. Let me prove that to you. Verse 32, again, I think is the, the key verse of this entire sermon. God raised this Jesus. We are all witnesses of that fact. Okay? What accounted... What accounted for the dramatic transformation of Jesus Christ, of of Jesus' disciples, from a cowering pack of pathetic losers and cowards into a powerful community of gospel-proclaiming preachers, who in one city in Acts, it's said of them that those who have turned the world upside down have come here also. What accounted for the transformation? The answer is, they came face to face with a resurrected Lord. They saw Jesus risen from the dead. That is the only thing that accounts for the dramatic turnaround of the disciples. Paul, in his famous statement of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and following, says this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom, Paul says, are still alive, so go ask them, but some of them have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and here only Paul gets to himself. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. There were people walking around at this time that you could go and ask, did Jesus get out of the tomb? You could go ask them. And they'd say, I've seen Jesus. I've seen the resurrected Christ. Go talk to them. Go ask them. Moreover, on the road to Emmaus, you remember that scene. It's a great Easter scene as well. Two of Jesus' disciples, unknowingly, at first, met and walked with the risen Jesus. You remember that beautiful scene of Luke 24. Luke writes in verse 31 of his last chapter, And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? While he opened to us the scriptures. Even Jesus was an expository preacher, you know that. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. That's Simon Peter who's preaching this sermon that we're talking about. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Peter preached Jesus because he saw Jesus resurrected. Time does not permit me this morning, but we could walk chapter after chapter through the book of Acts and note how the resurrection of Jesus Christ was the central capstone to first century apostolic preaching. The resurrection. Not just the cross, but the resurrection. In fact, there are nearly 30 instances in the book of Acts where Jesus is told to have been, has been raised, or his resurrection is cited, or others are raised in his power. Remember the lady Tabitha? I prefer her other name, Dorcas, but that's because I'm a middle school boy sometimes. I think that's a funny, a funny word. And then Eutychus uh, was also raised. By the way, Peter had a hand in raising Tabitha. Paul had a hand in raising Eutychus. I find that to be pretty awesome as well. Let me just give you a couple of these citations before we move on to our third point. Acts 1, verse 22. Acts 1, verse 22 speaks of the selection of Matthias as an apostle to replace Judas, who had betrayed Jesus. And we read in that verse, one of these men, notice, must become with us a witness to his resurrection. That's 
a foundational prerequisite for apostolic preaching. You must be a witness to the resurrection. Look also in Acts chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, Peter's second great sermon at Solomon's portico. Acts 3, 14, But you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. Acts 4, verse 33, we are told the entire apostolic witness is described to be, um, verse, Acts 4, 33 says, with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. You've heard this before, but Christianity is uniquely a religion of resurrection. There is no other religion but Christianity that boasts of a dead and risen leader. Christianity alone. Finally, Acts 13, verse 30. Got to let Paul get in here. These other ones were about Peter. The apostle Paul's preaching in Antioch focused, you bet it, you you guessed it, on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Acts 13, 30. But God raised him from the dead. Verse 34. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. And in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. Beloved, we could go on and on, chapter after chapter through the book of Acts, until coming to Paul's last speech before King Agrippa. Acts 26, 22. Paul says, to this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both the small and the great, to the important and the unimportant, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that Christ must suffer, and that being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Preach the resurrection. Preach the resurrection is the constant refrain throughout the book of Acts. Peter here has explained the outpouring of the Holy Spirit from the text of Scripture. He has interpreted the demonstration of God's power and promise through the grid of the gospel of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And now thirdly notice that Peter illustrates the reality of the resurrection from the life of King David himself. Verses 29 to 32, we see Peter flavoring or seasoning his first great sermon with a helpful bit of illustration concerning King David's own life. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Peter could stop there and simply say, if you have any doubt, go check his tomb. It's right over there. Go look for David's bones. I promise you they'll be in there. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of, his, one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. One pastor that I read this week said something so great. He said, The book of Genesis ends with the death of Joseph. The book of Deuteronomy ends with the death of Moses. The book of Joshua ends with the death of Joshua. But the Gospels end with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that changes everything. Isn't that awesome? Yaroslav Pelikan said, If Christ is not risen, nothing else matters. And if Christ is risen, nothing else matters. Peter illustrates the enormous implications of the resurrection by calling his readers right there in Jerusalem to weigh the evidence before them. Go to the tombs of David on the one hand or Jesus on the other. Go check them out. See which one's empty. You can check For yourself. We still have David's bones with us. Therefore, Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11, 
which are quoted for us in Acts 2, verses 25 to 28, must be talking about somebody else because it's not talking about David. David's still in his tomb. And in fact, we know, of course, it was talking about somebody else, David's greater son, the one who alone deserves to sit on the throne of David forever and ever and ever because he has risen from the dead, Jesus Christ. Beloved, this is why Jesus is, as Paul says in Colossians, the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. He is the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Simply put, the fact that Jesus' tomb is now empty powerfully illustrates the complete veracity, the truthfulness of the apostles' claim that Jesus had risen from the dead. That's why Paul could write in 1 Corinthians 15, even taunting death. Oh, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter explained, he interpreted, he illustrated. Don't, don't lose me. He applies. He applies in the last part. The significance of Jesus no longer being in the tomb. So what? So what if he's not in the tomb? Listen, every good gospel sermon culminates with the question, so what? If Jesus is not in the tomb, what does it matter to my life? What is the significance for my living today? Look at the text in verse 33, Acts 2. Being Therefore, exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He, Jesus, has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens. Guys, David was not talking about himself in Psalm 16 or Psalm 110. But rather, he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And verse 36 is really the the kicker. Let all the house of Israel therefore know with certainty that God has made him, Jesus, Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. That's how you apply a sermon, friends. That's how you do it right there. Notice that Peter looked into the testimony of the Holy Scriptures. He looked outward at the evidence of an empty tomb and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And he came to one inevitable conclusion. God has exalted this crucified and risen Jesus. He's exalted him to a position of authority, the highest authority. And he is now both Lord and Messiah. End of discussion. End of discussion. The scripture puts it this way in Romans 14, 9. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be both Lord of the dead and of the living. Those who turn to him and those who don't. Let me tell you right now, Jesus is Lord, whether you acknowledge it or not. But it's going to go a lot Better for you, friend, if you acknowledge that he is Lord before it's everlastingly too late. Jesus is Kyrios. He is Lord. You see, the Romans would say, the Greeks would say that Caesar is Lord. We as Christians say, no, Jesus is Lord. He is exalted in preeminence and possesses the same divine authority as God the Father himself. Even Philippians 2, 9 to 11 declares this. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you know Jesus as Lord today? Not only is he Lord, 
Peter says as well, he is Messiah. He is Kyrios, and he is Christos. He is Lord, and he is Messiah. You remember back in John chapter 1, when Peter's own brother came to him after meeting Jesus, do you remember what his brother Andrew said to him? He said, we have found the Messiah. We have found the Christos. Peter, come. We found the Messiah. They were looking for him for so many years. Now, years later, Peter, after his denial, after his failure, after he's forgiven, after Jesus' death and resurrection, Peter steps to the plate after he's been restored and he preaches that he knows Jesus is the Messiah. And listen, if the risen Christ is both Lord and Christ, then you must do something about it today. The worst thing you could do today is show up, sit up, and walk out without dealing with Jesus as Lord and Messiah. No one can walk out of this church today, I hope and pray, and claim before God ignorance about the gospel. You must do business with Jesus today. You must come face to face with the reality that if he was uh, God's son and died on the cross and rose from the dead, he is Lord. And if he isn't your Lord, guess who is? You are. And I promise you this, if you try to live as the Lord of your life, you will walk from one failure to the next. And you will not have anything that will ground you from the wrath of God on that final judgment. But if you acknowledge Jesus as Lord today, the wrath of God towards you has already been poured out. It was poured out on his son at Calvary. It was poured out on his son at the cross. You are shielded from the wrath of God if you are found by faith in the son of God in Jesus Christ. He is Lord and Messiah. All roads lead to Jesus. All roads lead to Jesus. But for some of us, that road through faith and repentance leads, through, leads to life eternal, leads to heaven and paradise. For others who persist in rebellion, that road leads to Jesus, but he is not the one who receives you. He is the one who condemns you because you come before him on your own standing and your own righteousness, which is no righteousness at all. How will you meet Jesus today? There's one bit of postscript because verse 36 effectively ends Peter's sermon if you notice his first great sermon we've heard his explanation of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in response to the crowd's question we we've considered his interpretation of recent events in light of the testimony of scripture and the evidence of an empty tomb we've touched on for a moment Peter's powerful illustration of the promise made to David that his descendant would be on the throne forever and ever and we've listened to Peter's succinct conclusion or application that Jesus is Lord and Messiah and we must do business with him. Verses 37 to 41 then give us simply a snapshot of what happened next. After Peter's great sermon at Pentecost, what were the results? How did people respond to such preaching? Look at the text again. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. <laughs> and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. The preaching of God's word, the preaching of the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ, is the only thing that cuts to the quick. It's the only thing that penetrates 
a heart of stone. It's the only thing that transforms a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. And friend, while it does not sound very pleasant or good, there is nothing more wonderful and life-giving or more worthy of celebration than when the gospel of Jesus Christ brings a sinner to his knees and brings the name of Jesus across his lips. There is nothing sweeter. There's nothing that sets off parties in heaven more than when a sinner comes home to the Savior. The church on Pentecost morning had 120 people in it. By the end of the day, and through a single sermon, there were 3,120 plus people in it. It's the stuff that preachers dream of. Friends, I'm telling you right now. One day, Lord. (laughs) One day. But here's the thing that you can't miss. Peter's preaching of the resurrected Christ still saves people today in 2023. This was not just relegated to one day in the ancient past. This message still saves people today. It can save you today. If you say with the crowd to Peter and to the preacher, Brother, what must I do to be saved? The good news is, Jesus is still in the saving business. He's still in the saving business. The good news is the prescription for your sin has not changed in 2,000 years. We don't need a new Savior to come come down because the cross is now depleted of its power. We have the only Savior that we need. We have the one who conquered sin and the grave. Repent, friend. Repent. Repent. The word repentance simply means to agree with God that he is right and you are wrong and to turn volitionally away from your sin. It is to walk a different direction. If you want to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you must deal with your other little g-gods. He will not cohabitate with other lords and other gods in your life. Jesus wants to put it the way the kids would do this way, he wants to be exclusive with you. He wants to be exclusive with you. He will not compete with others. So that's what you need to do today. You need to repent. And part of repentance is turning from your rebellion and turning to Jesus Christ and his provision of righteousness. It's saying, God, my hands are filthy with with sin. They are dripping red with rebellion. And turning to Christ, my hands can be made white as snow through the blood of Jesus Christ. Repent. And Peter says, be baptized. Now, be careful here. This is not adding a work to our salvation. But to be baptized is to step forward in identification with Jesus Christ. Because here's the thing. Jesus doesn't want you just to show up a couple times a year. He wants you to step out day after day and identify with his community regularly. And that is what baptism is really all about. Repent and be baptized. And guess what? What you saw happen on Pentecost morning with the Holy Spirit coming down, it can be yours. The Holy Spirit can fill you. You can walk a new path. You can love the Lord our God. You can walk in obedience You can have victory over sin and temptation because Jesus loves you and he died for you and he rose for you. Would you bow with me as I close? Almighty God and Father, again, we thank you for truly there have been, even this very day, tens of thousands of sermons proclaimed. But there is no sermon greater than the sermon that we have just heard Peter himself proclaim. Peter has proclaimed Christ crucified and risen from the dead. He has explained it. He has unpacked it. He has illustrated it. He has applied it. Oh Lord, I pray if there's one here this morning 
in a crowd this size, there's probably more than one. I pray that they, Lord, would come in repentance today. That they would accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, acknowledging Him as Lord and Messiah today. Oh, what a glorious resurrection day that would be for them. As someone said, because the tomb is empty, our lives can now be full. Lord, we praise you for that. And we thank you through Jesus, in whose name we pray.